Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you from uh, wherever you're joining. My name is uh, Fei Yu, and uh, I am the Deputy Representative for North America of the Asian Development Bank, or the ADB. Welcome to today's webinar on the Asian Economic Integration Report 2022, an annual publication that covers the latest trends and analysis on regional cooperation and integration in the Asia Pacific region. Today's webinar will focus on the 2022 theme chapter, uh, which is entitled Advancing Digital Services Trade in Asia and the Pacific. Before we start the presentation, I would like to say a few words about ADB's role in the Asia Pacific region and the North America representative office based in Washington, DC. ADB is a multilateral development bank established in 1966 and headquartered in Manila, the Philippines. The United States is one of its two largest shareholders together with Japan. Uh, of the 68 member countries uh, and or economies, 40 are in the Asia Pacific uh, who, who are borrowing from ADB. The main functions of the North American office are to mobilize financing and support for ADB's developing member countries, share development knowledge and experience, establish and deepen partnerships with public, private, and nonprofit organizations in North America. We encourage you to reach out to us if you have any questions about ADB's work beyond this briefing. We are very happy to engage. With that, I will turn things over to our co-host and moderator for today's discussion, Dr. Joshua Metzer, Senior Fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution. Over to you, Josh. Thanks, uh, Fayou, and it's a pleasure to be here co-hosting this event with ADB on this very important topic. Um, and we have a great um, event today, uh, very uh, you know, useful and I think excellent paper that's come out about um, particularly digital service trade, but an Asian economic integration report. Uh, and uh, so highly recommend um, everyone get into that. Um, th this is really timely and obviously very important. Uh, the, the digital space is growing significantly and as the, a lot of the, this report shows that the growth in, in digital services really now outpaces trade growth more broadly and provides an, an enormous amount of opportunity um, across the region. And so it's um, from a policy perspective, I think one area where it requires a lot of attention and focus to op maximise these opportunities. Um, there's a, there's a couple of ways that we think about digital services that we'll get into in the presentations, um, both in terms of the globalization of the internet and the ability to trade services globally directly, um, and that's an increasingly uh, real phenomena, and as well as in the role of digital services in global value chains. And there's a lot of work that's been increasingly looking at the role of services broadly in global value chains and the digital services component there um, is increasingly significant, but we do increasingly see that the most sort of value added global value chains are those not, not only that are utilizing increasing shares of services and digital services, but that are actually also substituting imported digital services into their global value chains to remain most competitive. So it's a story not only about exporting digital services, but actually utilizing digital technology, cloud computing, AI, blockchain, IoT, and these types of opportunities to actually maximize efficiencies and competitiveness of industries domestically as well. We also see that there is a, um, a very sort of rich um, policy landscape where one thinks about where progress is happening and not happening in terms of trying to liberalize um, opportunities. And I think the report makes at the point early on, which I think is really worth emphasizing that one of the things we actually do need to do is just liberalize services trade, uh, because it's always worth recalling that at least under WTO rules, if you've made a services trade liberalization commitment, you have also committed to the delivery of those digital data flows for the delivery of that service. And so liberalizing services as, as, as a thing in and of itself would also liberalize digital services. But in addition to that, we've got 
Um, a lot of attention being paid in the WTO on the e-commerce negotiations, which will, if it's successful, affect digital service trade. Um, there's increasingly robust digital chapters in FTAs in the Asia Pacific region. In fact, the, the region has really been leading, I think, some of those innovative developments in the FTA context when it comes to digital trade and digital services. And we're going to see a push on the US end for um, more, you know, a bigger role in the digital um, context, which will include digital services. This will include the Indo Pacific Economic Framework, which the administration will be talking about more over the next few months um, as well. So, with that, um, let me turn it over to um, our panelists to provide you with a lot more information and de detail about this report and what's going on in this space. Um, let me first introduce. Uh, Dr. Jong Wu Kang, who is Principal Economist at ADB's Economic Research and Cooperation Department. Uh, he's a seasoned economist with extensive knowledge and experience on policy and strategic issues. He was previously Senior Advisor to the Managing Director General of ADB and Senior Economist at Strategy and Policy Department at ADB and leads the annual publication of Asian Economic Integration Report. Uh, the other presenter and, and author is Dr. Pramila Cravelli, who's an economist at ADB's Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department. Her main fields of specialization are applied econometrics in international trade policy, regional trade agreements, trade negotiations, rule of origin, non-tariff measures, and geographical indications. Prior to joining ADB, she was an assistant professor at the Goethe University of Frankfurt, leading the chair of international trade. So with that, um, let me turn it now over to both of you to start your presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Josh Melter. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Um, we are very uh, pleased to join you uh, today to present on our uh, theme chapter of the Asian Economic Integration Report 2022, which is on advancing the digital service trade in Asia and the Pacific. So um, I'm going to share my presentation with my colleague, uh, Pramila, and then the uh, perhaps we can, uh, we have prepared a two minute short video clip, uh, which summarizes the main uh, messages of our, our of our report. So perhaps we can play the video clip first uh, to be followed by the more detailed presentation by us. Uh, can you move on to the next slide and uh, play the video clip? Rapid digitalization during the COVID-19 pandemic is expanding opportunities for digital services trade. Cross-border services are increasingly delivered online instead of physically. These include financial, legal, information and telecommunications, health, education, and other business services. Digital services trade can contribute to economic welfare and development. There are many potential synergies between digital services trade and other sectors. Growth in digital services trade in Asia and the Pacific is among the highest in the world. However, digital services trade as a share of total services trade in Asia still has room to grow. Closing the gap requires improving competitiveness in digital services. The region needs to invest more in human capital and ICT infrastructure. Policy and regulatory reforms are the key to higher competitiveness. International cooperation can reduce barriers to digital services trade promote system interoperability, and ensure fair taxation. Challenges must also be overcome to realize the full potential of digital services trade. Economic and social inequality between those with and without digital skills may worsen. Growing digital services trade calls for renewed attention to cybersecurity and privacy. What does it take to ensure that digital services trade contributes to inclusive growth in Asia and the Pacific? To find out, read the latest Asian Economic Integration Report. Okay, thanks. I hope you have enjoyed watching this short video clip. So now we can move on to the next slide.
Yes, so let me first uh, very briefly touch upon the background and motivation of our research on this very important topic as uh, emphasized by the Dr. Messer uh, during the introduction. Uh, so third unbundling uh, per the Richard Baldwin and other intellectuals um, characterized a new trend of the international division of labor. Um, uh, under the third unbundling, the production stages have been uh, fragmented across the borders uh, through the uh, global value chain streams. But uh, under the third unbundling, uh, more and more jobs are the, uh, uh, spread across the borders and uh, different people are engaging in different segments of the job streams. And so also sophistication of the manufacturing sector is uh, more proactively driven by many of the manufacturing powerhouse around the globe. So this uh, implies that we are facing a different modes of international division of labor. And also the COVID-19 pandemic, as we all know, has prom prompted the uh, digitalization of the economy. Uh, more and more and more producers and consumers engaging in the digital mode of production as well as consumption. And then the, as you can see from the chart below, uh, compared to the non-digital services trade like the transport and travel, uh, which have seen the quite dramatic plunge during the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. Other digital service trade like the um, insurance and financial services, ICT, and other business services have been quite uh, resilient uh, even under the pandemic. So next slide, please. So one key question could be uh, whether digital service exports can drive economic development, as you can see from the chart, the scattered plot chart. We can see the overall the quite positive association between the uh, digital service trade and the uh, uh, per capita GDP uh, level, uh, GNI per capita level across the globe. Uh, many of the Asian countries represented by the, uh, the, the red, uh, red the dots are lined, um, uh, the first quadrant, while the many of the advanced countries like uh, those in the North America and the Europe are uh, lying under the upper right uh, quadrant, which means that the more advanced countries are showing the higher level of the China as well as the uh, larger share of the digital service trade exports out of the total goods and services exports. Um, this is a simple association between the relationship um, the, on the relationship between the per capita GNI and the DDS exports. Um, but uh, we have also conducted some empirical uh, exercise uh, 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 replicating the Franca Roma approach, which was adopted in their the AR 1999 paper. And we have tested whether the, the growth of the digital service trade can have a positive impact on the per capita GNI and the per capita GDP. And uh, based on our empirical research, we can uh, clearly see that, that there is a positive causality between the share of the uh, DDS exports out of the total um, uh, trade and uh, the per capita GNI. And uh, this is more pronounced in the case of Asia and the Pacific. Next uh, slide, please. The scope of our research um, are using uh, quite extensively the data provided by the WTO and the OECD. Um, the digital delivery, digitally delivered services and as well as digitally delivered services. So as you can see from this left-hand side table, we have selected uh, basically six uh, services sectors like the insurance, pension services, financial services, ICT and um, computer services and the research and development and the other professional and management consulting services and audio and visual related services and other personal services. Um, these are based on the mode of uh, trade um, among the mode one, two, and three, and four modes of the trade and ser uh, services. We, we focus on the mode one, um, the uh, uh, consumption of uh, cross-border supply of the trade. Uh, and then the, uh, we foco focus on these six sectors and uh, we are using uh, BOP balance of uh, payment based data on the uh, trade and services trade statistics. So um, using the WTO OECD as a balance of trade and services BATIS data, we have conducted a quite uh, extensive analysis um, uh, on the main issues related to this, uh, this, this uh, trade and services in our uh, report. So next slide, please. 
Now, these are some examples um, based on the, our selection of the sectors on the digital uh, services and trade. For example, insurance, insurance and pension services are quite extensive, extensively using big data and the AI in the underwriting and the risk assessment. And then the, I, um, uh, the intellectual property rights and trademarks and uh, uh, properties are uh, entailing uh, the patent uh, portfolio and licenses and franchise fees uh, across the borders and other business services like the professional services, including legal accounting and advertising services and other types of management consulting services are all involving uh, some type of the cross-border trans transactions of digital services. And then the finance services, as we all know, the fintech and the digital payment, including e-wallet and the credit card based uh, uh, payment systems are uh, all used, are being used for the payment and settlement uh, services across the borders. And also ICT services, as we all know, the sort of software development and the data analytics and the cloud computing and other types of cybersecurity related -like services are being provided across the borders. And then the, um, lastly, the personal services include um, the telemedicine type of health services, as well as the online education services, uh, which have been quite the prevalent under the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. So next slide, please. As the Asia and the Pacific has been quite uh, uh, proactive in embracing uh, this the new trend of the developing digital service trade in recent decades. Uh, when it comes to total services, Asia's um, trend has been uh, quite, pro uh, quite prominent, but uh, in terms of digital service trade, it is more pronounced in the sense that uh, it's uh, global share increased from 70% to 24% uh, between the 2005 to 2020, 2020. Uh, so Asia is now accounts for around a quarter of the uh, total global uh, digital, uh, uh, digital trade services uh, in the world. But the, when it comes to the, the regions, uh, sure, I mean, out of the total uh, trade in services, the share uh, stays at around 55%, which is much lower than that for the EU and the US, North America. So which means that the, uh, although the region's uh, digital uh, trade services has grown quite fast, but there is still much room to improve on this area. Next slide, please. We have also looked at uh, what could be the main drivers or main factors of the digital service trade and then the, based on the literature and based on our own uh, uh, research, we have identified basically four factors, main factors. First one is human capital, second one is digital connectivity, and third one is the investment into the ICT sector, and the last one is the policy and the regulatory environment. Here we are presenting the, um, how these main factors are, can affect uh, digital service trade. In the first uh, scatter plot, as you can see that uh, there is uh, uh, positive association between the expected school years of schooling and the digital service trade uh, share out of the GDP. And then, the, as we all know, the, 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 the higher the education level, uh, the, the higher the level of the computer adoption of digital literacy. Uh, so this is kind of bedrock of the developing the digital service trade uh, in the country. And the second one is the digital connectivity and the um, Basically, the, the second scatter plot and the third scatter plot are about the digital connectivity. And then the third one, let me just touch upon the third one first, the mobile broadband subs subscriptions. This, is, this measures uh, how many people have access to the mobile the broadband. And then the second one is about the internet bandwidth uh, per uh, internet user. So this measures the capacity and the quality of the internet connectivity. So as you can see from these two scatter plots, at least for Asia and the Pacific, uh, simple access, although both, uh, both uh, variables uh, show the past, positive association with the digital service trade out of GDP share, but uh, when it comes to the degree and the significance of its association, uh, we can see that the quality and the capacity of the internet connectivity is much more important than the simple accessibility uh, through the mobile uh, subscription. 
as you can see from the second and the third scatter plan. Uh, so from the policy and the regulated environment onwards, uh, let, me now, let me now hand it over to Pramila, my colleague. Pramila, please. Thank you very much, uh, Jogu, and thank you very much to uh, the organizer for having us today. It's a great pleasure. Uh, yes, I will talk about policies. Can we go to next slide, please? Okay. So about uh, policies, uh, first uh, element that I want to share is that the region needs to embrace further efforts for domestic uh, re deregulation, trade liberalization, and international cooperation. This is our main message in the policy area. Now, uh, on, the, on the screen, what you have is um, data uh, for 17 Asian economies on the Digital Services Trade Restrictiveness Index, the DSTRI. And we can see that the total number of restrictions increased from 138 in 2015 to uh, 153 in 2020 with barriers that relate to cross-border data flows accounting on average for 20% over this period. So, uh, next slide, please. So based on this, um, I would say this observation, we uh, conducted an, an empirical exercise using a computational general equilibrium model. Um, and we made use of the ADB uh, multi-regional input output data to simulate the impact of two scenarios. The first scenario is a trade liberalization scenario uh, where you have uh, trade costs redu uh, reduced by 10%, but only uh, international costs, uh, international cost and international costs are unchanged. And the second uh, scenario is domestic deregulation. So again, a 10% reduction in cost, but all costs international and international. And under each scenario, the model measures the spillover impact on trade and income across sectors. Uh, uh, so when these 10% of transactions costs are reduced for digital services sector. Next slide, please. Okay. So this exercise uh, points to sizable economic gates from trade liberalization and the regulation of the digital services sectors. Uh, in fact, while the trade liberalization and the regulation scenarios um, generate significant increase in both what we call backward and forward GDC linkages of these specific sectors, it can also lead to stronger GDC linkages of other manufacturing and services sectors through spillover effects. And uh, on screen, this you can see this uh, in the graph with uh, only few digital sectors that have been shocked in the model, so where we have reduced trade cost, these are uh, the sectors within the red um, dashed line, DDS sectors, but you can see that all sectors are actually being impacted, showing the, uh, the very the potential of digital services sectors uh, to have a positive spillover on the whole economy. Next slide, please. The digital services trade is also heavily reliant on the transmission of data across, across economies, obviously. So we conducted another empirical exercise using a difference in difference approach, econometric approach, where we compare uh, digital services and non-digital services sectors, and we estimate the impact of the three of three types of data flow restrictions in um, on Asia's trade compared to other regions. So uh, first we have data localization, DL, uh, which means that data processing is required entirely in the host economy without uh, any rep repatriation um, possible or allowed. But uh, the st local storage means that at least a copy of the processed data should be stored locally. And the uh, last type of um, Restriction is what we call conditional flow regimes, which means that data can, can be transferred, but under certain conditions, for example, that can be the customer consent. So uh, these data related restriction, we can see uh, based on our results, they raise the cost for companies to conduct business across borders and lead to lower level of digital services imports compared to non-digital sectors. And um, this is even more true. I mean, the effect is stronger uh, in Asian economies 
where the proportion of data localization measures is in fact larger than in the rest of the world, with 70% of the measures uh, imposed worldwide are in fact in Asia. Um, next slide, please. So these results showing the importance of the regulation of the liberalization also highlight the uh, importance of regulation in general and regulation of digital services trade that can, that can take place at different levels. It can be at the multilateral level, regional or domestic level. Let me start with the multilateral level where the main obligations uh, of the regulation of digital services trade uh, exist under the WTO legal framework in the telecom annex of the GATS, the General Agreements on Trading Services. Some key considerations uh, uh, remain despite this regulation because first, we have a classification issue. Uh, the classification is about how you classify a specific, a specific product. Do we trade goods or do, do we trade services? This is not always easy to distinguish, but it has important implications in the application, for example, either or, um, border measures, if it is a good, or domestic regulation when it is a service. Now, so the second issue that uh, uh, is quite important in regulating uh, digital services trade at the WTO is the degree of liberalization that can vary significantly from known to unbound. So really some countries do not commit anything or some countries liberalize totally. So there is a lot of variability. And finally, there are also many uh, exceptions that allow deviations from trade obligations for legitimate policy object, uh, objectives or policy reasons. Now, uh, at the regional level, we have also regulations in regional trade agreements. There are three main sovereign approaches that we identify in, and discuss uh, more in the report. Those are the ones adopted by US, uh, the PRC and the EU. And those approaches are in fact balancing in different ways the interest of the main stakeholders that are the consumers, the private sector and the uh, government. And so this approach can also serve and in fact have already served as references for the negotiations of new agreements or revisions of existing ones. Next slide, please. To assess the state of play in the um, Asia and the Pacific, we conducted a mapping uh, of the main uh, regional trade agreements in the region uh, that contains chapters on e-commerce or digital trade. Uh, and we took agreements from uh, 2000 uh, till, till now. And the mapping groups digital trade provisions into four categories. The first one is trade facilitation, second is enabling business, third consumer protection, and uh, the last one is regulatory autonomy. And the results show that both the number of agreements and uh, of digital provisions have been increasing over the last decade, so that you can see in the first uh, in the first uh, in the first graph. And in fact, among the four categories uh, of provisions, trade facilitation is the most common, with more than seventy-five percent of regional trade agreements included in our analysis that uh, have at least two provisions in the category of trade facilitation. And overall, 26% of the free trade agreements we have uh, considered include provisions in all four categories. So it means 26% do have at least one um, uh, provision in, in, each, uh, in each of these categories. Next slide, please. So we have seen multilateral, regional, and now what about the domestic level? In fact, uh, at the, the domestic regulation is extremely important uh, in the in uh, regulating digital services trade, and um, it includes a wide range of uh, areas such as transparency, the regulation, qualifications requirements, procedures, technical standards, licensing requirements, and, and so on. But it also needs to be acknowledged that the digital economy raises additional difficulties. How to ensure transaction safety? for example, or how do you prevent cybercrime? How do you ensure confidentiality or integrity? And these are issues that also need to be uh, addressed. And this will be addressed by national cybersecurity regulations. And this might be quite challenging, uh, especially uh, for uh, developing economies or least developed countries. 
And it is also sometimes quite difficult to distinguish leg legitimate policy objectives from protectionism when you analyze such uh, policies. Now, um, finally, and I think most importantly, when uh, regulating uh, domestic, uh, domestic uh, regulation for services trade, uh, it's important to notice that, um, that the cross-border nature of digital services trade requires inter international cooperation. So meaning countries need to collaborate and work together, together in uh, do regulating this uh, domestic aspect. And uh, this, uh, this international cooperation can take the form of mutual recognition agreements. It can be formalized at the WTO, for example, in pre-relative negotiations or translated into you know, informal arrangements as well. Next slide, please. The digitalization has enabled firms to deliver services digitally, but it also created scope for distortions of tax rules. And unilateral measures such as digital services taxes could potentially prompt retaliatory measures, including, for example, tariffs or other barriers to trade. So the multilateral corporate tax agreement reached last October, uh, including a new regime, uh, uh, sorry, a new um, taxing right without physical presence. And the minimum corporate tax rate is in fact a turning point. And the regional cooperation be, will be essential to adapt uh, the, the national framework, so to the, the national framework adapt to these agreements that will enter into force by 2023. Meanwhile, economies in the region can consider other measures, such as expanding the value added tax on digital transactions to include also imported digital services. As the new tax rules are in fact gradually implemented, um, their effects on the competition and investment uh, are still unclear and ne needs to be uh, further assessed. Uh, next slide. So now uh, I, we arrive at the end of this presentation. So let me uh, summarize the main policy recommendations of this report. So the first is that economies need investments not only in uh, ICD infrastructure and connectivity, but also in human capital to strengthen their digital capacity. Reducing international, internal and external cost of trade in digital services through the regulation, as we have seen, or of services sectors, and also trade liberalization could strengthen the GVC, the global value chain's participation and translate into significant real income gains through direct effect, but also through spillover effects uh, on the whole economy. Economies need to assess and balance their interests between safeguarding cybersecurity, data protection, and privacy on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, they also need to support freer trade, um, uh, freer data flow, and uh, to, to promote, to facilitate uh, business for, for borders, business of digital services. Um, economy level, uh, economy level regulatory reforms should be complemented uh, by international cooperation and in particular in prelateral initiatives. That can be regional trade agreements, a digital economy agreements, international tax cooperation, material recognition agreements, and those things can really be, those elements can be instrumental in achieving transparent, fair and harmonized regulations, taxation and liberalization. And finally, very importantly, in this process, governments should take into account the possibility, the possible differential impacts and trade-offs. For example, if you think of skilled versus unskilled workers or uh, urban versus rural areas to foster competitiveness of digital services across the society while addressing at the same time the digital divide and the distributional impact of those policies. So that's all. On my side, thank you very much. Thank you, um, both of you. That was a very detailed and fascinating presentation. Um, I just want to remind the audience that if you do want to ask questions, um, please use the Q&A function um, and I'll uh, try to pick up some of the questions and direct them to the panelists. There's a lot there, so I'm just going to start out um, by asking the panelists um, a, a few questions. One of the things, um, 
it, it seems to me when we talk about the the distinction between service trade, digital services trade, and you had, I think, a useful graph there showing growth in services trade and growth in digital services trade. And, and you see a lot of similarities. You see some regions doing better with digital services than they do with services generally. Um, but how, if, if, if we take, say, for instance, um, you know, insurance and pension services, one, one category you focused on, um, you know, it seems to me on, on there's a couple of ways one could think about what it means for that to be traditionally delivered, uh, maybe through mode three commercial presence in countries and so forth, um, through a fully digital version of that. And, and at one level, it could just be a substitution where all we're doing is we're delivering it digitally and you don't expect it to change in terms of growth or quality um, and so forth. It seems to me that there's a couple of other dimensions where digital could, though, in fact, change the quality and the distribution of the services. One is, and I think you touch on this, um, which is you um, could use data analytics, for instance, to actually provide more targeted, better insurance. Right? You could you could get you could get the tail end of the of the market that maybe doesn't get good coverage. Um, you could target your insurance coverage more sort of. Um, accurately, depending on the risks of actually, you know, the businesses or individuals based on better data collection. So you may actually have, um, you know, more sophisticated, more targeted insurance services. On the other hand, you also, and this is not an, an and or, but I, I, I think also what seems to come out a bit in your presentation is this opportunity um, across the Asia Pacific to, for countries to participate in the delivery of these services. So in insurance services, I think you identified you know, Indonesia and Vietnam, when one thinks about professional services, you could you could think about, you know, the scope from India. Um, so you could imagine that more opportunity opens up for participation in the delivery of these high-end services. So I, 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 my, I guess my question to you is, is how do you see um, sort of the, the, the change from traditional services to digital services um, as more than just a substitution effect um, and what does it mean? What does it mean in terms of opportunity for the region? So perhaps I can go first, and if anything to complement the uh, that can come in uh, later. So, as it, you, you are quite right in a sense that, that there could be some substitution effect uh, where the some of the traditional service can be replaced uh, through the digital mode of transactions. And also there are other segments where the, um, the delivery mode of the service could be only, almost only available through the online mode of the transaction, like ICT services, cloud computing services. Um, so those are the usually can be delivered only uh, through the internet system and then the online mode of uh, transactions. But uh, when it comes to the tra traditional finance service, service, like the insurance you have uh, related to yeah, definitely uh, some portion of the traditional service can be replaced with the digital mode of transaction. But as you have also highlighted, not only the pure subsidy back, but in terms of quality and the coverage, for example, the, from both the supplier and the cons consumer side. Mm -hmm. uh, in the supplier side, as you have mentioned, and the, the, uh, not only the entertaining the, the domestic demand, but also global coverage of the uh, the consumers, they can try to serve the growing the demand of the diverse different types of the insurance um, uh, services and also using data analytics and AI type of the uh, high technology, they can um, develop and the services, the more custom tailored type of insurance services, and also consumer side as well. So instead of just relying on the small scope of the domestic insurance market, they can go outside of the, uh, the domestic territories and they can look for some other diverse type of the insurance services available from the outside of the country. So it will uh, enhance both the supply um, and the producer and the consumer supplies uh, quite, quite, uh, quite certainly. Um, so it will uh, enhance the, the, <laughs> the people's welfare around the globe. That's my conviction. Okay, Pramila, do you have anything to add or yeah? Not, not really. I think it was quite clear also that if you increase the supply and demand, then we also expect to increase uh, competitiveness simply because you have, will have more competition and so somehow more efficiency uh, in, in, in the process. So that's where, I mean, I think Jungkook clearly said that it should benefit consumer and um, 
the overall society uh, at the end. But that. No, that's very helpful. Um, I'm going to try to channel a question that's coming um, from the audience and put this in the context of the extent that um, the transition to digital is really blurring this distinction between what are goods and services. And I think that comes through somewhat in your um, discussion about the role of digital services in supply chains. Um, you know, I thought that graph where you showed the, um, you know, the results of your modelling, um, which, you know, I think was clear that there were going to be, you know, gains across all sectors, more or less, um, you know, pretty, pretty important um, sort of point to make. Um, but, it, you know, what, what how, how do you, I guess, one of the things that comes up, if you sort of think about this transition from what we traditionally think of goods being delivered as services, and increasingly these are digital services. Um, so, I, you know, sometimes I think about, if you think about, you um, Sometimes it may it may be if you, like there's an example sometimes which gets used about you know Rolls Royce um, you know turbo jet engines where they now sort of sell them as kind of like a service package rather than buying the actual product um, you know increasingly you can think about more prosaic items like books and DVDs and software which we don't actually sort of move across borders in physical form but as as digital files essentially um, and then then. The policy analogue to these developments, I guess, is that increasingly um, goods are sort of being treated like services and services which you showed are more restrictive generally than, than goods. Um, how, how do you think about this um, certification, I guess, of, of, of the world? What does it mean for the Asia Pacific? And, and do you have any, I mean, you pulled out some policy implications, but um, it seems to me it sharpens the importance of getting at the services liberalisation piece um, as this trend continues, but I want to sort of turn it over to you to see if you've got any further thoughts on that. Yeah, so the certification of the manufacturing sector is quite, uh, uh, quite progress quite rapidly in a sense. And then, the, for example, in the automobile sector, as we have alluded to the Rolls Royce, but not only Rolls Royce, but in the case of Honda or Toyota or the Hyundai and the Asian car manufacturers, uh, for example, Honda is uh, operating uh, some services um, the companies in the Philippines. So uh, although they are the sourcing the many of the uh, intermediate goods from the Thailand and the Vietnam or the harness wires and other types of intermediate goods for the automobile manufacturing, but also they are outsourcing some service uh, uh, functions to some of the ASEAN countries, uh, utilizing some of the low wage costs there. Uh, so many of the Asian countries are embracing the certification of manufacturing sector quite, quite uh, proactively. So I think that that kind of trend will um, will the, the strengthen further and further going forward. I think. Um, yeah, primarily, do you want to? Do you want to um, I, maybe I just want to <laughs> compliment. Um, it, 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 I'm not sure if it was exactly in the question, but it was also, you know, why do we need this distinction between between goods and services? And here I, I would like just to, to point out that it's quite important just about regulatory issues, you know, because basically if you think of goods that are intangible and sometimes it's difficult to 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 classify them, if you think I'm buy, I mean buying a, watching a, a movie on Netflix, you know, and then is it is it a good that I goes cross border or is it a service that I um, um, buy? And it makes a big difference, and th that's the classification I mentioned, uh, at, for example, at the WHO, because goods are all. Uh, <clears throat> Subject to border measures, so you can have tariffs not, and uh, and um, MFN clause, so Ministry of Nations, National Agreement. You have a lot of different uh, elements that applies to goods. Well, and 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 the countries are much more uh, committed because they have commitments at the WTO. Their re regulation is quite it's, it's much clearer. But when it's classified as a services, then countries have more leeway. To adapt, you know, to apply the regulations, um, the domestic regulations they want, and that's also the reason why the international cooperation uh, in this area in domestic regulation is is quite important. Yeah, no, I I think that's a, that's a really great point. Um, it, it, yeah, be, it, because it, it, at some level, I mean, you you had going back to the example of India um, as a potential, you know, key source of a whole range of professional services, but we see this with platforms. 
um, you know, in, in the US, um, you know, Upwork, Fiverr, where, you know, there are people from all over the world now providing, you know, a range of sort of essentially services. Uh, but as you sort of graduate up into legal and accounting and in the health area, the regulatory issues, I think, will be absolutely crucial if we're going to make this turn into a real economic opportunity. Um, I've got another question from the audience, um, and this is sort of around the question of the importance of data. Now, you do get into this in a little detail in your presentation. There's a bit more in the in the report. You, you um, but what's I think key as a starting point is that access to data and use of data is a very important part of this picture here. You sort of make a very clear case for the importance of commitments to cross-border data flows in, in trade agreements. Worth noting that one of the, I think, challenges in that policy space is getting the commitment, but also having appropriate exceptions um, to that commitment. So the exceptions provision, for instance, in RCEP is a very different exceptions provision than the exception provision of CPTPP, and that will make a, a very big difference about in terms of the strength of that data flow commitment. Um, but access to data is an important part of this here. Now, you, you talked about um, one of the things that governments are doing is increasingly looking at open data, providing more government data um, available um, for use, and that's going to potentially drive a lot of new business cases and opportunities for innovation. Um, but there's a tension here, which you do pick up at the end also with other regulatory goals, such as cybersecurity and particularly privacy. Um, just an open question to you, how do you think about sort of balancing these important goals of, of making more data available and making it available across borders with these other regulatory goals like privacy or cybersecurity? Perhaps Pramila, you can come in first and I can add more, yeah. Okay, uh, sure. Uh, well, first of all, that, well, there is no clear cut answer because obviously each country needs to assess its its own, you know, interest. But um, I I discussed, I think I mentioned those three approaches that have been adopted by USEU and um, the PRC, and these are children usually as models because they they have adopted really different views. And this is always about who, you, uh, which stakeholders you want to, you know, protect, and which stakeholder. Uh, and so, for example, if you take the EU, they have the focus on on consumers, where uh, US is, is known to have the focus on on firms, and the PRC more a bit more focus on on uh, the government. And I think it mostly reflects also the, your economic uh, structure and what do they export. If you think of um, the US, uh, they are have, as I mentioned, Netflix or other, uh, you know, they have a lot of digital services, services that are digitally delivered. And in this context, uh, it makes sense to have policies where you have more freer data flows, because it is basically to protect your business, which is highly developed. Now, if you think of Asia, where you have um, possibly like um, platforms of e-commerce, for example, the platforms of e-commerce also involved a lot of uh, involve a lot of data, but the good is not digitally delivered. The good is still, you know, crossing borders, and there uh, the interest then might might be different, and so you don't have the same needs based on your on on what you what you are specialized in and what you export. So. Um, I, I would suggest first to have a very careful analysis of which sectors and which area we want to focus and then based on that, um, you know, balance uh, the, the interest of the stakeholders. Um, John Wu? Yeah, so I think that the open data approach is quite appealing idea. And, uh, uh, but at the moment, I am, I'm not so sure whether the, it is also only adopt, even adopted by the advanced economies like the US, for example, when it comes to the trying to utilize the data collected by Facebook, of which the Meta is now the parent company, even for the research purpose, I think there is some limitation still there. So how much the digital platforms are willing to open data, open their own data collected from the consumers? Because in a sense that uh, data is kind of new oil, <laughs> it's a source of their uh, value addition and the, their the value creation in a sense. So uh, there is some limitation still there. Uh, but um, when it comes to the open uh, and pursuing the open data uh, arrangement, it's quite, 
critical even for the competition policy perspective because the, many of the digital platforms are the so-called the gated keepers. Uh, they have collected a lot of the consumer uh, information and that they're utilizing the consumer information for their own use only, but uh, that, that could be a quite high barrier for the new entrants because they have not uh, accumulated enough information from the consumer. So then the, that could uh, undermine the level playing field between the existing players and the new entrants. So how much the government can make intervention is in this area to level the playing field. So thank you. Um, no, that's very helpful. It's a complicated area. I, I think um, the point about balancing is, is clearly um, clearly the right one there. The, um, I, I want to turn just briefly uh, to the opportunities here for SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, while we're being very focused on uh, the services element, a uh, related um, part of this is the role um, for e-commerce here and platforms to support e-commerce, which I think still con is considered one of the key opportunities for small um, and, and medium-sized enterprises to participate in trade and digital trade specifically. And if you look at platforms, whether it's um, you know, Alibaba or, or eBay or Mercado Libre or, or Amazon, they've got a lot of digital services embedded in the platform, which really perform a lot of important roles from obviously deep financial transactions. Um, you know, they support inter um, interactions with uh, delivery services, uh, ratings and, and so forth. So this is very much a digital services space um, that makes it possible. How do you think about opportunities in the region um, that digital services and sort of digital trade broadly provide for small businesses? Yes, so China's is, case is quite prominent in a sense that Alibaba I mean, the, and other big uh, tech companies like Tencent are playing a quite uh, crucial role in providing some services for the small and medium enterprises. Um, so in a sense, it, it, it has also uh, been due to the, the Chinese government uh, intentional policy in a sense that during the initial stage of the tech development, they have uh, kept the nurturing, the enabling environment. Although the last year there have been some, um, some potential <laughs> controversies uh, around, around the, the, the crackdowns on tech companies. But, uh, it has uh, ensured some kind of spillover impact, ripple effect uh, across the board uh, in, in supporting the SMEs. Uh, this might not be applicable to other countries in Asia at the moment. So still there are many countries uh, which are having the small and medium enterprises uh, which cannot have access to the international trade, nonetheless, uh, let alone the, the digital service trade. So um, uh, in that sense, there is still a uh, role to be played by the government. For example, in the case of Vietnam, they have uh, launched uh, uh, some uh, dedicated uh, digital platform to uh, entertain the SMEs, the uh, B2B e-commerce transactions, and also ADBs provide some technical assistance to allow PDR to launch the, another type of B2B platform dedicated to the SMEs. So some kind of the, the intervention from the government can uh, be uh, the driver for the development and the supporting the, the SMEs in this area. Yeah, thank you. Pramila, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I think also we can, uh, because uh, we talk about digital platforms and, and e-commerce and so the digital services part is 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 embedded into into the, in fact as I mentioned before is a trading goods at the end, but if you think we can think also of all the uh, professional services that we mentioned less because maybe they are not as important um, in the economy, but still, I think we noticed with COVID that uh, there has been uh, many new opportunities uh, for professional services to be delivered. Uh, online, especially um, uh, in the areas in the health sector, I think, right, you can have a doctor co medical consultations online, and um, you know, even education, because I think I have never seen as many, you know, uh, seminars or open courses, open classes um, online around the world, uh, and I think there are um, various opportunities that arise also for uh, smaller uh, businesses in, uh, in this area. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a question. I'm going to, I'm going to probably, this might be, be the last question. What, I want to have a, a bit more of a policy-focused question. When it comes to 
where governments uh, may uh, should focus their attention and their energies. Um, let's starting with the WTO. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the telecommunications annex, Pramila, in, in your presentation. There's there's a lot going on in the WTO that matters for digital trade. As you know, there's the the GATS, which is very significant because if you've made a services commitment there, you've got a commitment to the data flows. There's the um, the ITA agreements on on the goods side. There's financial services commitments on data flows, um, and, and the list goes on. Um, and now there's the e-commerce negotiations underway there. So there is there is a, there's clearly a, 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 an existing role and a potentially hopefully future role for the WTO. But if you were to advise a government in the region um, as where they should be focusing their attentions in terms of the biggest bang for the buck from an effort at liberalisation, whether it's through a trade agreement or, or focusing domestically, what would what would your advice be? Personally, I would advise to follow both tracks at the same time, <laughs> because um, simply because you mentioned WTO, but you know things are not evolving at the same uh, speed space. You know, uh, trade agreements is very different in nature. You you, you negotiate with countries uh, where you share interests bilaterally or regionally. So uh, uh, while the, the WTO negotiations are extremely important, but uh, I think one does not prevent the other. And I think, I mean, it's, I, I would say it's extremely important to, to, to be part of the negotiations at the WTO. And this is also something I think that we say in the report. It's extremely important that, uh, especially developing economies, least developed countries, they do not just, you know, witness the evolution, but participate. And uh, as it has been the case, if you think of the negotiation in IP rights, I mean, years ago, uh, these developed countries, developing economies would not even participate because they would think, you know, it's only for developed economies. And then by the time they develop their own, you know, industries or their own um, innovative uh, innovations, then it's too late. The rules are set. So uh, in this context, I think it's very important that countries do participate uh, from now uh, immediately, uh, from the beginning. But at the same time, uh, negotiating trade agreements is, is, a, is a different approach, but which can be and I think could continue to be followed, uh, depending on, on interest and uh, common common interest in the region, and just like uh, or, or mega regionals like ourselves. Thank you. Okay, just to complement to what uh, Pramila had just mentioned, uh, not only the WTO level or the multilateral trade agreement, but also bilateral level, if not the trade agreement, but uh, some type of mutual recognition arrangement could be quite helpful. Because the different professionals cannot uh, cannot uh, run their own businesses in the different country without uh, benefiting from the mutual recognition arrangement across the borders, and also the as the prime last pre presentation has clearly shown, the, uh, I'd like we cannot under overestimate the importance of uh, domestic deregulation because the, many of the uh, Asian countries are still adopting the quite uh, rigid. Uh, and the strict regulation in the services sector at large, as well as the uh, digital services. So uh, based on our uh, regression exercise, the 10% the uh, reduction of the domestic regulation will, um, will lead to the huge amount of real income gains as well as trade gains. So I'd like to advocate that kind of deregulation approaches in the region. Thank you. Yeah, the, the domestic regulation piece, you see this in, in the US, it's, it's an increasingly um, important part of a comprehensive liberalisation agenda. Of course, you run into the political economy of vested interests, um, and these regulations have sort of been built up over many years, so unwinding them is challenging. But I, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, I think there's a lot of good research which also shows that um, if you look at Japan, if you look at um, South Korea, you know, they've increasingly, their value chains um, have transitioned away from digital domestic inputs to imported inputs, um, and, but it's, 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 it's improved the competitiveness of, of their global value chains more broadly, and you can think about that across industries. Um, so this seems like uh, you've you've laid out, I think, a very a very comprehensive sort of agenda for governments in the region, both in terms of the international trade negotiation piece, international cooperation broadly, because obviously MRAs and so forth require international cooperation, but also really a domestic agenda. There's a lot of agencies that governments have if they can find the political kind of space to actually go ahead and liberalise, and that would, I think you show through your modelling, deliver a lot of important gains as well. Um, so I think we've come up um, to the hour, so let me 
uh, say firstly, thank you to the panelists um, for their work on this excellent report and, and their very comprehensive presentation and, and, and answering all the questions. Thank you to the audience for um, your participation and your questions. Um, thank you very much to ADB for co-hosting this um, and to Laura for all of her work and to Fei Yu. Um, and I'm happy to close it out here unless ADB wants to have any final words. Otherwise, um, it's uh, goodbye at my end. <laughs>